All right. Good morning, everybody. Hope everybody can hear me. Uh, good morning on this beautiful Thursday here. Uh, thank you for joining us for the fourth webinar here in 2021. My name is Anthony Connors, and I'm the regional field en engineer for the Michigan and Toledo area, uh, and I'm going to be your host for today. Uh, real quickly, I'll go over just a couple of things you might be noticing here if you haven't been to one of our type of e events here. Uh, you probably already noticed this, but you uh, your camera and, and microphone will be turned off. And on the right side of your screen, you should be seeing a handy Q&A feature. Uh, if you have any questions that come up during, during the presentation, you can feel free to submit them there with your first and last name. And as the presentation goes on, we're going to take some time at the end, end of the presentation to answer your questions. Uh, if for some reason you don't see that or, or, or it's not working for you, you can always email your questions to solutions.michigan at swagelot.com and we'll add your questions to the list for our presenter today. Uh, but with that out of the way, I would now like to welcome back Chris Kiesling for joining us today. Uh, Chris Chris is a chemical engineer with over 15 years of experience here in, in the field before joining the Swage Lock team just three years ago as our operations director, uh, making him the perfect candidate to take us through the webinar on ball valve selection. So without further ado, I'll now turn it over to Chris. Yeah, hey, thanks a lot, Anthony. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us today. Really excited to talk a little bit about ball valves. Um, so again, if you've been with us before, you'll recognize this, but we always go over our agenda slide on the what, when, and why. So our goal here is we want to go over the selection of correct ball valves for your specific applications. Um, we're going to do this during our design and also for maintaining a system or trying to upgrade um, or maybe even solve a problem is when we're going to want to use this information. Uh, the reason we're going to do this is we want to max maximize our lifespan of the valve, uh, ensure safety, obviously, and prevent common issues. So we really want to get you with the right ball valve for that specific application. So you get a long life out of it um, and it's the most, uh, the best economical and overall choice for you. Uh, so some of the topics we're going to cover is when to and when not to use a ball valve. We've hit on that in a couple of previous webinars, but it's always good to go over that. Um, seems like it's a very common question that we get from customers. Uh, different ball valve types, what to look for and recognizing not all ball valves are created equal. So a couple of tips on what, what you should be looking for when you buy a ball valve um, or for an application. Then finally, some additional considerations and some options out there. Just get your mind going on some things that might help you out uh, when you go to use a ball valve for, for controlling your system. So we'll start off with a little ball valve 101. On the right here, we have an exploded view of one of our 60 series ball valves. Um, so what is a ball valve? Why do we call it a ball valve? Well, a ball valve, it uses a spherical ball with a hole bored through in the center, and that's for control. And this is for on-off control of, of your media. So it's basically just turning things on and turning them off. And that ball is this element right here, numbered 16. Um, that turns side to side, and that's what's going to open the flow path and close the flow path. In that, it's it's a quarter turn. So um, as opposed to a needle valve or a gate valve or maybe a globe valve, we have to turn it multiple times, get it full open. One nice thing about a ball valve is that you can have fast on and off by just hitting that handle and doing a quick quarter turn. Um, some of the advantages, it's again, easy manual operation. It's pretty easy to automate. Your, uh, your actuator just really has to do a 90 degree turn. So that's pretty nice. Um, they have very long life when taken care of properly. Uh, they can be very robust. It's a very compact design as well, so you can fit it between, uh, you know, it doesn't require a big spool of pipe or something like you would get with a larger globe valve or maybe with a needle. So that right there is the ball, like I mentioned, uh, number 16. So that's where the name comes from. Now, one thing we want to cover too is what, what ball valves are not for. Um, so again, they're for on off, they're for isolation. What a ball valve is not for is uh, really not great for pressure control. Um, once you start opening that ball and get the, the valve aperture open a little bit, you pretty much have full pressure pretty quickly because of the way it's shaped. It doesn't have any sort of shape inside for metering, throttling, or any sort of pressure control. So they're really not for that. Um, really not great for pressure, bleed, or relief. Part of the reason why that is is because, and, and again, they get used for this quite often. So I guess if you want fast pressure relief, it's okay for that. But one thing you have to recognize is it's going to dump your system really fast. Um, so that might be bad for your system. So we don't always want to use it for that type of, uh, of an application. Also, oxygen systems. So these actually kind of go hand in hand. Part of the reason for that we don't want to use a ball valve and oxygen system is that fast shot off with oxygen can cause a fast adiabatic comp uh, uh, compression, which can heat up in your oxygen system. And if you have anything that's potentially combustible in it, you can start a chain reaction fire. So we try to avoid ball valves and instead go for like a multi-turn needle valve so the pressure or the shutoff happens very slowly over time uh, and tempers that reaction. Um, but again, the biggest thing is we want to avoid any sort of throttling on these valves. They should be full open or full closed all the time. The reason for that is if you have um, it just slightly open, you can cause seat erosion on the valve seat and then your valve will start leaking by. You won't get the full life out of it. So how does it work? 
Uh, the ball is a rotating element, and that's what provides the on off. So it's another version of a cutaway. This is in the uh, technically it's in the off direction. The handle makes it look like it's in the on direction, which is interesting. Um, but again, the ball when it's uh, when it's going against the body right there, when it's 90 degrees to flow, it's going to be in the off position. And then the valve seats are going to provide isolation uh, and sealing between the inlet and the outlet side. So you have some kind of seat here. Um, in this case, this is like a ring-shaped seat, which is pretty common. And that seating material is going to seal the ball. Um, so it's pretty easy to manufacture and make kind of everything circular. So um, very straightforward and e easy to get a really good um, uh, a good seal. One other thing we have to note when we're talking about isolation and sealing is the stem packing. Um, so the stem packing is this, this seal that sits up here, and that's what basically seals your process media from the outside atmosphere. Um, so we see uh, when we do a lot of um, uh, surveys, and we'll talk about it a little bit later as a special focus, we see a lot of times where we find uh, stem leakage, and that's not really just ball valves, really across all valves uh, on these packings. So we, we want to pay attention to that and understand that that packing is an important seal. We need to know what it's made out of and know that it's, it's compatible with our system. We also have to maintain it just like we maintain the rest of the parts in our, our process. So there's various classification of ball valves. Um, there's one piece, two piece, and three piece are the most common. There's also some hybrids out there and kind of some other styles, but those three are really going to be your most common uh, types of ball valves, either one, two, or three piece. And I'm going to walk you through what that means and what to look for in each one. So one piece ball valve is pretty common. Um, a lot of them, the, the less expensive versions are pressed together. Uh, so you can't take it apart. You can't take the ball back out and service it. It kind of just is what it is. Um, they can have adjustable stem packing, which is why it says adjustable stem packing with a question mark. Um, some do and some actually don't. Some is just all pressed in, so you can't make any sort of adjustments if you do see a packing leak there. In the Swayzok world, we this is our 40 series ball valve. is kind of our, our bread and butter of the one piece world. We have a couple other designs, but mostly what we see there is a 40 series. And that lower picture, so the upper picture is kind of an inexpensive uh, pressed in ball valve. The, the lower is is the, the Swayzok 40 series. Um, on that, the stem packing is adjustable and everything is actually loaded in from the top. So that's why it's one piece body. Um, so the the seats on the valve, the ball and everything when we assemble it just loads in from the top and it's all tightened down with that stem packing. Um, because of that, the packing nut also adjusts uh, the loading on the seats. So if you have a spot where you have a, a ball valve that's leaking by when it's isolated, it's possible you actually have to adjust that stem packing. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, there is no adjustability from the side on the seats that you see with some of the other valves we're gonna go through in a second. Nice thing too about 40 series ball valves is they're they're very easy to panel mount. Um, maybe hard to tell here unless you've had one in your hands, but this piece right here is actually a large nut. You can just drill a pan a hole in the panel, use that nut to hold it right down, and, and it gets held on just by underneath the um, the valve handle there. So it's a really good strong mounting application for that specific valve. We're going to see these in a lot of general use applications. Um, one challenge on the 40 series is it's a little, uh, usually be, is a little smaller bore size. So we see it a lot with instrumentation, sampling systems, things like that. Um, there is a broad range of applications though with our just standard seals. Pretty much all the sealing surfaces in there are Teflon material. So as long as you're compatible with that, we see a large range of compatibility as far as systems go um, with the 40 series ball valve. So very, very popular item for us. So from one piece, we move into our next evolution, which is a two piece ball valve. So one nice thing with the two-piece ball valve is most of the body is all solid. It's all one piece with the exception of this end and that unthreads. Um, so you can actually see there's a little seam right there and that's the piece that you can loosen and take off. And that's how the construction actually happens on it. So you load the ball, you load your seals in on that side and then you can adjust that uh, to get the preload correct on your packing. Um, so you can sometimes make adjustments to those packing. A lot of them aren't really made to be adjusted. You kind of tighten it down as hard as you can tighten it, and that's just where it ends up. But it does allow you to rebuild it. Um, so you can rebuild that valve. The only challenge with it is you have to isolate and remove it from your system. So you have to physically disconnect the valve, take it out of your system to be able to take that end cap off and uh, and deal with the rebuild on it. Um, not the worst thing on earth, but again, um, not perfectly ideal necessarily either. One pro tip I give you here is uh, make sure you hold the ceiling in with a wrench when you're removing it. So right there where that seam is, you'll see there's a uh, nut flats on there or on the on the uh, that seal piece. If you're going to take, say, a threaded piece of NPT pipe out of here with a pipe wrench, you want to make sure you always put a wrench across these nut flats because what can happen as you're trying to loosen that nipple, you can actually end up loosening this, which will immediately relieve tension on the seat. And if you have any pressure on the other side of this, you can have a leak immediately, which can be very dangerous to, to an operator or maintenance person. So again, ideally, you really don't want to be taking these apart in general when they're under pressure. 
But if you do have one that's, say, closed off and holding back pressure underneath on a vent or something, um, and you're starting to loosen up the NPT on here, just make sure you're paying attention that you're not unscrewing this body because you can't have a big problem really fast. Again, very general use applications, and you see these a lot on utility systems or general service. So from two piece, we're going to evolve into the three piece ball valve. Um, this is the Swage Lock 60 series. Um, so our three piece ball valve is a flange design and this actually allows field rebuild. So I include this photo down here. This is kind of like the swing out version of this. So there's four bolts that hold the flange faces together and put the compression onto the, the valve seats themselves. So that's what's putting your load on your valve seats. Um, with that, you can loosen three of the valves or three of the bolts, I'm sorry, right in your process with this isolated, obviously. Swing it out and you can actually remove the ball. You can change the seats. You can do any maintenance you need to on that, on that ball valve um, right there in the field, in line, in place. Um, so it's a really nice feature on three-piece ball valves. Um, there's a wide range of material available. One nice thing is you can actually vary the two flanges on these. If you want two different materials of flanges, you can change the seats. I don't know why you'd want two different seats on it, but you can do that if you want to. But again, the seats all press in and you can actually do field rebuilds with these as well. So there's field re service kits that are available. Um, so it's, it's pretty easy and, and great to maintain. Um, the other nice thing is these can be welded into a system without damaging the seals. Why I say that is what you can do is actually disassemble the valve and take one of these flanges off as a weld on flange. You can weld it on with just the metal there. Once it cools, then put all this back on here and you won't have any damage from heat to these seals. So really nice solution for a weld in, um, a weld -in situation with those flanges. Um, again, uh, this is also a floating ball de design. I'm going to explain floating balls versus trunnion balls on the next one. The 60 series is the one that has the floating ball. Nice thing with that is that it, it compensates a little bit. It's part of the seal design. So when this is closed and you put pressure on one side, it's actually going to press it into the seal face as you have pressure variations and make sure you're holding a good tight seal there. The other nice thing, and as promised, we'll get into packing here in a minute, but this also has a Chevron style packing. Uh, so that's a, a pretty uh, unique feature of this Swage Lock 60 series ball valves. And because of that really high quality packing and because of all the features I've outlined in the, in the uh, rebuildability and the field maintenance ability, this application is great for industrial applications. So we see these all over the place in, uh, in facilities, in operating processes. Um, it's available all the way up through our entire size range, all the way up to two inch, I believe. Um, and again, it's great for welded lines for the reasons I just mentioned. So one quick thing on the difference between floating ball valves and, uh, and trunnion balls. Um, so there's really two types of designs and I outlined what a floating ball meant with that 60 series because it was a nice way to see it with a, with a uh, cutaway. The other option is, is a trunnion ball. Um, so on a trunnion ball, it's actually shaped kind of like a spool piece and this is a cutaway one down here. This is kind of a graphic of it as well. So the bottom part is actually fixed. And so it's almost, you, you've kind of, it's like having a bushing on the top and the bottom. So you're supporting that ball on both sides. With a floating ball, it's supported only on the top. So with those, it, it actually lowers your actuation torque. It can also prevent blowout if you're afraid of the potential of overpressurization. So if you have that isolated, because you've got that fixed in two spots, it's gonna resist uh, the possible of a pressure surge and having some kind of a blowout as well. Um, in the, the world of Swage Lock, the 40 series is a trunnion ball, um, so it's supported on both ends. But really, a lot of times with trunnion ball valves, we look to the Swage Lock 83 series valve. And that's what we have a picture of on the bottom here. Um, the, th the 83 series is actually a three-piece design, but instead of being flanges that are held on by four bolts or eight bolts like the uh, uh, 60 series, this is actually screwed in. So these two ends are actually uh, screwed on the side, and that gives compression to this, uh, this seal. That that is also giving you spring loading on the seats. So the seats actually have a spring loading with this stack of uh, spring loaded washers that are in here. Um, you can vary the materials. So you get a lot of different material options. And you can change these out um, to exactly what you need. And because of the spring loaded seats and because of the trunnion operation and the, and the design of it, we get higher pressure ratings with these valves. So with the, uh, with the 83 series uh, ball valve, you can get up to 10,000 PSI pressure rating under certain conditions and with the uh, correct uh, applications. The one downside of the 83 series ball valve is because we built all that strength in there, we get limited CV ranges. So you have to keep an eye on the CV because these generally have a different orifice size drilling through the center of the ball. So um, just watch and make sure you're getting the flow capacity you want if you're going to spec this for like a high pressure application. So as promised, we want to walk through and talk about stem packing really quickly as a special focus. So um, you know, packing all valves, not just ball valves, and we've talked about this on previous webinars as well, they all are going to have some kind of a packing or some kind of a, of a seal that seals between the, um, 
the uh, the valve itself, the valve body and the atmosphere to keep fluid from coming out. Now, generally, they don't all have packing. There are bellows valves and some other packless valves that exist out there. But for most of our general use valves, ball valves especially, gate valves, globe valves, those types of applications, um, butterfly valves, you're always going to see some kind of a packing seal on that, um, on that valve. So just to kind of show what you're looking at, this is an example of one of our 40 series ball valves. So in the top there, it's the valve with the handle on. If you remove that handle, there's a set screw on the side. Directly under it, you're gonna see this. It's just basically a little uh, hex flat there or a hex wrench application. And I outlined it there just so you can see it nice and bright. Um, what you're gonna do, there'll be a manufacturer spec. We've got specs for it. Um, and uh, and regardless of who you buy your valves from, there's always gonna be a torque spec for your valve seat or for your um, uh, stem packings. You'll use a torque wrench, and that's what we have on the right-hand side here, to torque that down to whatever uh, to whatever torque you want for the uh, um, for the application. This, as I mentioned earlier, is the top reason we find for leakage on surveys that we do in in uh, in plants. So number one across valves is stem leakage. Um, so again, a spot where I think a lot of us kind of put this in, set it, and forget it. But ultimately, that seal is going to be wearing every single time you actuate the valve. And after months and years um, actuating it a lot, you're going to eventually wear that down and have and require a little bit of an adjustment. Um, so on the, the design side, just to give you a visual of what's going on. So if this is our, um, our setup here on the left-hand side is a one-piece packing, which is a more traditional packing. You have that packing nut on top. It's basically causing some kind of compression, whether it's a uh, spring load or some kind of a stack of washers or something or a packing gland on top. That's going to push down. The yellow part here is our packing. So that might be an elastomer or some sort of other sealing material. That's going to push down. It's going to squeeze it against the stem. Okay. Um, this is a traditional one-piece packing, which is common on a lot of valves. I mentioned on the 60 series that it has a chevron packing. It's actually a two-piece application. It's got this uh, triangular type of shape to it. So what happens as it pushes down, it's actually making a wedge, which pushes then down and against and counterbalances the forces going up against the stem um, from the body below. So it's going to give you actually a su superior uh, um, stem uh, leakage performance. It's a really high-quality option for um, for a uh, for stem seals. So again, either one of these, you're going to have to do periodic packing adjustments. So just be familiar with that and uh, make sure we're keeping an eye on those things and, uh, and we're maintaining those uh, when at all possible. So another piece that I want to touch on really quickly too is um, if we over tighten packing. So if we want to make sure that we're tightening this to the spec. Uh, why wouldn't we just keep going tighter, tighter, tighter and just go out there with a wrench? Why do we want to use a torque wrench on these? Well, if you over tighten these, since this is squishing down and squeezing on the stem to create the seal, what's going to happen? Well, it's going to make more, more friction and more drag on the stem. So it could make the valve hard to open. Um, so you want to make sure you're not over tightening those. And furthermore, if you ever have to change the packing out, if you're rebuilding this valve, I advise everybody never rebuild a valve or loosen a packing nut when the valve is under pressure um, because it's going to unload the valve. You're going to have a material leak potentially right away. So never, never reduce the tension on that packing nut, nut unless the valve is fully isolated and depressurized. Uh, it can be a very dangerous situation. So some final notes on ball valve selection, um, a little bit on bore size and CV. So remember, not all ball valves are full ported. I mentioned that the CVs can be lower on the 83 series because of the size of the orifices. Um, a four, full, bow, full bore ball valve um, is going to be your best option for ma maximum flow. I didn't touch on it here, but that's our GB series of ball valve. It's a newer application for us. Allow those in higher pressures. They can go up to 6,000 PSI and also have full bore available. So you have full flow through your line size. Um, so again, if you're going for high CV, a, a really large uh, amount of flow, full bore is the way you want to go with that one. But again, even with ball valves, always check your CV uh, to make sure you're not going to limit your system flow, especially with uh, orifice drilled ball valves. Uh, one thing you want to pay close attention to is pressure ratings over your, your entire temperature range. So depending on the seals that are inside of there, you can have D ratings of how much pressure containment there is at higher temperatures. Um, so you want to always look at, for your operating temperature and also your maximum temperature, what is the pressure containment, and make sure that's compatible with the pressure that you're going to see in your system. Some operation options you can have. We didn't touch on with photos here, but we have locking handles available, so you can actually change the handle out to a locking handle um, for lockout purposes. A few really uh, slick options there. Um, you can add an actuator so you can automate the ball valve. Um, you can get different ball vents. So when it's isolated, you can depressurize the upstream or the downstream side anytime it's isolated if you need that for your application and a lot more. So those are all available in our catalog. Um, you can look them up yourself or reach out to us if you uh, have a specific application you're looking for a, uh, a more unique ball valve application. 
And then on the material option side, we do have special application ball valves um, that are designed for known challenges. So for example, we have valves for chlorine services that have seats pre-selected that are going to, um, to resist chlorine attack, which is a common problem. Um, AFS is actually the alternative fuel systems ball valves. They were designed for LPG, liquid petroleum gas applications. But we find a lot of uh, people who are doing CO2 e extraction actually like those AFS valves as well, because it's a similar type of application uh, where you're dealing with liquefied CO2 and you can have vaporization. So those AFS valves actually do a great job for them. So again, these all have, we have some special application ones pre-selected out there. Best bet if you have a really tough application or you're challenging or challenged to find the right ball valve, give us a call and we'd love to talk with you more about what options are available. Finally, an, an option too, if you have uh, needs for NACE compliance or low E certifications, uh, low E is low emissions. Um, a lot of folks are under low E orders from, from the EPA these days. Uh, those are available for many of our valves. Not every single valve is low E or NACE certified. Sometimes you have to have specific designators. Again, best bet is to reach out or look through the catalog. You can find NACE compliant information on what designators you have to order in order to make sure your valves are compliant. But those are offered uh, across a lot of the swage lock valves in our range. So to wrap up and review, ball valve selection, our goal was to be able to select the right ball valve for your specific application. We're going to do that during the design and maintenance phases. And our goal is to maximize the lifespan of the valve, uh, ensure that we're safe and we're keeping our people safe, and also prevent common issues that we see in the field. So with that, are there any questions? Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Chris. It was a great presentation there. Um, yes, yeah, so like Chris mentioned, we're going to take some time here to answer some some of your guys' questions here with the remaining time we have left. Uh, looks like we got a bunch in the Q&A side over there already. Uh, just a reminder, if, if you do have any questions, you can submit them there and we'll try to get to them. But uh, first question here for you, Chris, is from Kellen. And Kellen is asking, I need an on-off valve for 3,000 plus PSI. Is there a ball valve for that? Sure. Uh, so there's a couple options. One of them is uh, our 40 series valve. If that's going to work for your uh, for your application, that'll that'll be able to do 3,000 psi. It won't be a challenge there. Um, so if you're looking for other options, um, there's a couple other specialty valves in the line. But generally for 3,000 psi, I would probably point you to the 40 series. Um, if you don't have what you need in the CV or the size range, best bet is reach on out, and we'll uh, we can walk you through and try to find something that's uh, that's the right application. But generally in those pressures, the uh, the 40 series is a good option. The GB also, if you're looking for full port and you're looking for um, uh, full flow type valve, the GB can be a really good option too. So again, biggest thing is uh, you'll have to look at, um, that's a guess based on not knowing what your materials, your temperatures are. So again, just check those material compatibilities and the temperature compatibility with what you're running in the system. And I can't say it enough, just reach on out. We'd love to help you. Yeah, always, always reach out. Um, next question here, Chris, is from Logan. Logan's asking, do you have valves and actuators that can handle negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit? He's looking to install a few on some test equipment. Okay, sure. Um, so on the negative 30 degree Fahrenheit side, again, going back to the 40 series ball valve, um, it's a pretty good choice. I believe those are rated all the way down to negative 65 Fahrenheit if you uh, specify the, the right uh, materials on there. So um, those are available. Um, that's probably your, your best bet overall, depending on exactly what your application is. Um, when you get into some of the other ball valves, um, you have to watch because a lot of them are a zero degree rating um, depending on the material selected. But um, again, I would point back to the 40 series on that side. Um, but again, reach on out and we can discuss further to make sure we capture all of your actual needs. I guess kind of what I'm touching on with maybe those first two answers, maybe I didn't get so deep with it in the presentation, but um, next month we're actually talking about the stamp method for product selection. So it might be a good time to tune in because we're going to go through what are all the different criteria that you need to meet. So um, temperature, obviously pressure are kind of one piece of it, but we also have to make sure we have material compatibility um, that we meet the needs of, of the application specifically. So um, again, that, that works on the surface, but uh, it will uh, matter quite a bit of what, exactly what your material is and, and kind of what your operation looks like. Yep, great. Uh, next question here is from Forrest, and Forrest is asking, I can partially open or close a ball valve, right? Is there some issue with doing that? All right, so that you do not want to do. Um, so we touched on a little bit in the presentation, but one challenge with throttling the ball valve is you are going to put a lot of wear on the actual valve the, on the seat itself. Um, so what happens is you it's kind of like we call it throttling, but it's going to act a lot like uh, if you put your thumb over the end of a hose and you get a really fast spray. So you get very high velocity of your fluids 
right between basically the opening of the ball and where the edge of the seat is. And you can have uh, excessive seat wear when that happens. And that's going to affect the performance of your ball valve. So not a good idea. The other thing you can get is build up too when you when you run it uh, partially open. When they're fully open, they're going to flush the ball out really well. You're going to get a lot of uh, velocity in the direction you want. You can get a uh, um, strange buildup and things like that inside the valve when you run them partially open because you'll get little flow eddies um, on the sides of the ball. So not recommended to run them throttled or partially open. Uh, we really want to run these in an on or off position, full on or full off to get the most out of them. Yep, exactly. Uh, okay, Lee has a pretty interesting question here for you, Chris. Uh, Lee's asking, how is valve leakage measured and do you have specs for maximum leakage for new valves? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, so our testing, the testing on the ball valve is uh, is generally factory tested and with nitrogen at 1,000 PSI. Um, and we use a leak detector and we're looking for a, a seat leak of less than a, a tenth of a standard cubic cubic centimeter per minute is, uh, is our standard on that one. Um, Again, shell testing is also performed um, with a liquid leak detector. So it's kind of a mix of both is we're, we're doing like a volumetric test on them, but we're also doing a um, uh, just a visual test with liquid leak detector. So both of those um, are employed. And again, if you have very specific uh, needs on a valve or if you wanted additional testing, we can talk about that as well. Um, most of the testing is in our catalog. So if there's a specific valve you're looking for, um, best bet is to look up in the EDTR or electronic catalog um, and you can find the testing to kind of tell you how we're certifying each valve. But um, again, we're trying to do, do basically a pressurized leak down test is how we're doing that. Yep. Yeah, in that uh, in that um, catalog there, you should be able to find some product test, test reports that'll kind of help uh, show the leak, leak test that, that we're running for each valve. Yeah, that's a good point, Anthony, too, is if you, if you have a specific application or a specific valve, again, it's a great time to reach out because we can do a little research and make sure you have product test reports around that specific valve and application to make sure we have a test that we've ran. It's been a lot of lab tests done over the years on a lot of different materials on the swage lock side. So, um, a lot, you know, sometimes we have access to some older, deeper information where we did specific studies that might uh, apply to your specific application better. Yeah, exactly. All right, moving on here, a uh, couple more. Uh, this one's from Henry, and Henry's asking, what type of valves would be best for dry powders? For dry powders, that's an interesting question. Um, so for dry, dry applications, generally a ball valve is going to be a, a good choice. I would say what you're probably going to want to work with, and if you're looking at dry or like slurries, things like that, um, you're probably going to want to look towards a fully or a full flow ball valve. And the reason why I say that is because when you're doing dealing with dry materials or when you're dealing with slurries, if you have any sort of restriction inside, what can happen is that can make basically like a shelf that your material can build up on and you start to get bridging apart and it can plug off very quickly. That's why you want to keep that fully open port. So it's just a straight shot right through the valve. You have no spots or shelves or discontinuity. If you're dealing with dry powders, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about of what would happen if you put a hard elbow in versus a very long sweeping elbow, right? It's why we always want really long sweep, sweeps and not very tight bends when we're dealing with dry materials or with slurries because anything that causes any sort of disruption in flow can be a spot for material to build up and plug off. So I would recommend going over to our GB series ball valve, which is our full flow design, uh, fully ported. Um, again, make sure your materials are compatible, but that should be a good solution for you. Great. All right. And last question real, real quick here, Chris. Uh, Paul is asking, are there field kits uh, available for maintenance? That's an easy question because the answer is yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do have field kits. There's maintenance kits for pretty much and rebuild kits for pretty much all the ball valves um, that we offer um, over the wide range. So uh, again, catalog has ordering information. If you're struggling on exactly which one to order, give us a call and we can help you out with that. All right. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we're running just a short time here, so that'll be it for questions. Uh, thank you all for those who submitted them. Uh, hopefully we were able to get to just about all of them. Um, if you if we didn't get to your question or, you know, you have a question that comes up later, you can feel free to follow up by email um, and or always reach out to your account manager. But just a couple of things here so we can wrap up the wet, wet webinar. Uh, first uh, is we'll be sending out some useful reference material for you guys. Uh, first is a uh, resource that should help you with all your valve and um, re regulator selection needs. 
Uh, and we're also going to be linking an article that aids in matching each valve type to their respective functions. Um, and always, you know, definitely try to get us out there to help you. Um, you can always schedule a virtual meeting now with, with times as they are with our field engineering team at michigan.swagelab.com. Um, and definitely be sure to join us next month uh, as we talk about the stamped method, as Chris said mentioned earlier. Um, that webinar will be on May 20th and at 10 a.m. again. Uh, for any questions, concerns, or feedback regarding the webinar, please email us at solutions.michigan at swagelock.com. And I want to thank you all again for joining us today. And for more information about our web webinars, please feel free to visit our website at michigan.swagelock.com. Thank you all and have a great rest of the day. Yeah, thanks everybody. Have a great day.